Thank you, guys. Thank you, worship team. Um, that was really great. And uh, there was a verse he said, um, basically, didn't get what I got. Um, following God, the reward thereof, not worthy of it, so to speak. In the past several weeks we've been in Joshua, a lot of the Israelites, believers of God, um, they weren't perfect. They followed God, they clinged to him by faith, they followed his way, and they got more than what they bargained for. And for many of them, some of them actually strayed away, but others were like, no, I'm going to go the route of God. I'm going to follow the Lord. And so we come in tonight at our passage, um, Joshua 22, chapter 22, and it's going to be nine verses. Bible open. All right, so wanted to do some slides today. Let's see if we get. It's okay if the slides don't come up. <laughs> so, oh, oh, perfect. Let's go back really quickly, because I want you to see the the title here. Don't stop now. Keep loving God. Um, when I was reading this title uh, and, and reading through the message and the passage, um, a lot of things stand out. But love is key. Love comes out a lot. And um, in terms of the actions of these tribes and what they've done and what they do and how that shows a type of love, um, one of the things that we got to remember in the past seven weeks is that these people have been waiting. These Israelites have been waiting. They've been told for many of them, possibly since childbirth, because when Moses went to Canaan, he didn't get through. God told him to go back to the desert. That generation is going to die, that God is going to work with that second generation to raise up children to adults. So when they cross over, they're a different breed of a follower of God, and, and they're willing to work the things out of God's ways, even if it means to go to Jericho, a city by which they're kind of hesitant, and there might be some fear that, whoa, we, we might not make it, but the fear of the Lord is so much greater, and, and you know, God is powerful. He did this thing uh, in the Red Sea, and he did this thing crossing the Jordan. I, I, we're going to go through it. We're going to follow God. Yes, we are. Lord, it's, it's us versus them. And God is saying, you're doing this for, number one, the promise I gave your forefather, Abraham, number two, because you're, you're my people, and there's a bigger plan at work. And I just kept thinking about this whole waiting. So we work, worked it out the past couple weeks with the inheritance. All these tribes were, were waiting for their inheritance, and they finally got their inheritance. We got to see the Levitical cities, the priesthood within the land of the promised land, the refuge cities, to give people a second chance that if they killed someone, they might have a second chance at a fair trial. We started seeing justice play out on top of the promised land, the inheritance given to God's people. So now we're still here. The past couple of weeks, we've been at Shiloh. And at Shiloh, they've been dishing out the inheritance. You get a land, you get a land, you get a city, you get a land. And here we enter our, our uh, passage here, and I'm just going to get into it. Um, 22, <clears throat> verse 1. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gedites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I've commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. 
And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he has promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land of where your possession lies, which Moses, a servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cling to him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Verse 7, now to the one half of tribe Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but to the other half, Joshua had given a possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, go back to your tents, with much wealth, with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to their land in Gilead, their own land of which they have possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses. What's going on? I know some of you, if, you're, if this is your first night tonight, you're thinking, what, what was all that going on? Uh, we're in Old Testament. That's number one. Uh, this is Joshua's conquest. Um, and what's going on is, again, the promise to Abraham, given down to generation to generation, to give his people, his descendants, a land of their own. Because for a long time, they didn't, they didn't have a land to call their home. For a long time, they, they really just waited on this promise that never came. But then it did. Then they got their land, they got their inheritance. God came through on his promise. God gave them rest from all the battles and the war. And here what's going on is three Three of the tribes are kind of the ones we're looking at today. So I want to go back really quickly to verse 1. So who are these Reubenites and Gadites and half-tribe of Manasseh? So we look at the Gadites, obviously from Gad. Reubenites of Reuben, half-tribe of Manasseh, which is son of of Joseph, Joseph being one of the 12 boys of Jacob, Jacob who was renamed Israel. So God had gave Jacob kind of the, the reins or lordship, if you will, that he was going to make a great nation out of Jacob, the house of Jacob, whose name is Israel. Jacob had sons, one of them being Joseph. Long story with Joseph had two other sons, one named Manasseh. So Manasseh steps in his father's place, takes the inheritance. Reuben gets inheritance. Gad gets inheritance. Another thing going on in this verse that we see, it's, it's a, a, a callback to chapter 1 of Joshua because this is the tail end of the inheritance. The inheritance was given. The Levitical cities were given. The refugee, the refuge cities were given. So now we're at the end, the end of the war. In the beginning of the war, there was this, not a question, but a, if you will, a, a microscope on Joshua's command. Moses had just died. Now it's time for Joshua to step in. And God was going to raise him just to be a leader, just like Moses. So here at the tail end, we get that this is Joshua. Joshua's summoning the people. He's the commander. And you'll see this in Joshua verse uh, 1, or chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. So the verse 2, and I want to go through the verses step by step. And he said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, Obeyed my voice, all that I have commanded you. 
So what is this kind of referring to? This is a callback. Because there are things in motion going on. What are the things that the Gad, Rubens, and, and, and Manessa, what do they do? What was going on? There's something prior that took place. And it had to do with basically the parents of these people who are receiving the inheritance. So let me take you back to Numbers 32. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land the Lord has given them? The next one is 16 to 18. Then they came near to him and said, we will build sheep holds here for our livestock. So now Gad, Reuben are saying back to, to Moses, we're going to build cities, but we will take up arms. So we will stay and fight. Later on it says, and our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance. So here in our passage, Joshua 22, go back about 47 plus years ago, there was this conversation that took place before they entered the promised land. Moses was basically saying, hey, look, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, your lands are right here. We're actually in your land. You can, you can stay, right? But I'm asking you to fight for us, to stay. You're part of the promised land. You're part of that promise. The Lord has commanded us to do this together. Will you stay and fight with us? And what they're saying here is we will not return to our homes. So we're going to stay. We're going to fight. And it says here, until we have brought them to their place. Who are they talking to about? They're talking about their brothers. See, the three brothers, these are tribes, the three brothers, they got their lands. They got their lands, but their other brothers did not. So instead of saying, you know what, we're, we're just going to keep what we got now. We got the promised land. Who, who cares about what's in Canaan? We, we got our stuff on the other side of Jordan. We're good. Now there is a sense of nobility. There's a sense of compassion, sense of obedience to God's word and his people. Call it brotherly love, if you will. They had compassion to say, hey, we're, we're going to risk our lives. We're going to stay and fight and make sure that they're given the inheritance. Because I already got my lot. I already got my stuff. But I want to see my brothers get theirs. So it's a big difference between the leadership under Moses and the leadership under Joshua. But we see that Moses is, is a priesthood, he's a commander, and he's the leader, he's the one called to lead God's people. He's working this out. He's bringing this out within the people. And it's kind of like, if you will, a father saying, you have siblings, you have brothers, be with your brothers. Help your, your brother, help your sister, help them out. I know at times um, now with my son, the, the other day I was doing a, a homework. I had a test I was studying for and I was doing some reading. And I heard my wife tell my son, uh, can you help me wash this bottle for your sister? Now my daughter is six weeks old. So we're doing some formula. And so my son he starts to actually scrub the bottle. And I'm like, what? I'm trying to get him to pick up his shoes. He won't do that, but he will get up into the dishes and clean. I'm like, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm cleaning this for Miriam. In other words, I'm doing this for my sister. I'm doing this for her. So we, we get that in the background of the text. We get that, we forget too, although these are tribes, they're siblings. They represent brothers. They represent a family. They represent a family of God, a people of God, and a nation of God. 
So a people of God wouldn't have love? They wouldn't have compassion? No, they, they would. They would act it out. It's keeping the family together. So I try to get a good picture for you guys, but the red is Gilead, and there is a portion in the middle that is the uh, Dead Sea. Right above it, it's a Jordan River. So the part of where Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, that they were going to settle, is in that red space on the, the right side of the picture of the Jordan, the east side, that Transjordan area. And this is what it ended up looking at, East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. So the Canaan, land of Canaan, was on the other side of Jordan, where all other tribes are at. So essentially what was going on is at the Jordan crossing with Moses, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben had their lands. It might not have been official, but it was, hey, these are your lands, you're going to settle, oh, we can start building now. And they say to Moses, you know what? No, we'll stay and fight. We will stay and fight. Then when we get Joshua in chapter 1, Joshua brings up those same tribes and says, remember your oath. Remember the promise you made to Moses, to God. Remember your obedience. Remember that you were going to stay and fight with us. And they say, yeah, you're right. So we'll send our men of valor you might have heard that in chapter one. We'll send our fighting forces, and then the women and children will stay behind in these lands. We will not see them. We will not know if we'll ever come home to see them again. But we will help our brothers get the other stuff. So this is calling back to the whole kept, obeyed. In verse 3, you have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. So it's kind of retelling that, what I just said, right? It's part of the background. This is Joshua. Joshua is saying this. So Joshua is seeing the actions of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh and saying, you know what, you've, you've been a good lot. You didn't have to stay and fight. I mean, you could have just disobeyed and God did with whatever he was going to do with you out of your disobedience. You already had your treasure of land, but you, you stayed with your brothers. You remembered them. You remembered the oaths. You remembered the promise. And you kept the charge of the Lord your God. Remember, throughout all the fighting that was going on, there were certain things they couldn't do. And we saw that with Achan. We saw how he kept, he coveted something that he wasn't supposed to. His whole family dies. So when we say keep the charge of the Lord, it's keeping his, his ways, his commandments. And Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh did just that. They kept to it. The three tribes so I want to focus on a little bit of things here today, and you're going to see some Moses and some, some Joshua that I was talking about, because in this passage, what we're seeing is God's promise and the things that God was going to do for these people, but also it's a difference between Moses and Joshua, two different commands, two different leaders. And what we get from Joshua's story is the way Joshua speaks in this passage, this staying with God, keeping to kept with them, to kept with God's ways, to keep the faith. You kept his commands. You stayed obedient. You clinged to the, world, to the Lord. You clung to him, excuse me. Now, if any of you guys read chapter 22, you would know that later on, something goes awry. So the three tribes, the three brothers, do something that kind of provokes the other brothers to want to take up arms against them. So this verse 3, you haven't forsaken your brothers, you stayed true to them. There's a bit of an irony there, because later on, the next passage in verse 10 starts that irony for us. We start to see that 
something happens. In verse 4, and now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers. He has promised them. Therefore, turn, go to your tents in the land where your possession lies. Again, talking about the other side of Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. So this is the whole your service is done. You did good. It's, it's done. You can, you can go home now. This feeds off that whole service to the Lord, serving God's people. And in our passage tonight, there is one verse that stands out amongst the rest. Because the other verses, we, we see an account of what happened. We see kind of like this is what really, this, we see almost a narration of what Joshua was saying and his leadership thereof. But then something happens here in verse 5. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments to cling to him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. That last part, does that sound familiar to any of you? Maybe something that Jesus spoke about? To love God with all your heart, with all your soul? What's interesting is Joshua is saying this. So Joshua is looking at his people his fellow brothers, his cousins, his clansmen, his kinsmen, he's looking at them and saying, whoa, you guys, you're doing a lot. You're doing good stuff. I'm going to take note of this. These things that you're doing, this is what it means to walk in the Lord. This is what it means. But this also becomes an instruction for us, just as it is for those three tribes but it's also a send-off. And finally, in verse 6, we see, So Joshua blessed them and sent them away. They went to their tents. Their tents were outside of Shiloh. And before they could go home, they had to pack up. So they went to their tents to do just that. They didn't go home right away. And now to one half the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan. But to the other half, Joshua had given possession beside their brothers. So again, the, what, wants, what they want to, us to know here is that they're not splitting. The, the brothers, they're, they're not, the promised land is not divided, so to speak. There's unity amongst the tribes. There is a oneness amongst the tribe. They're all brothers. They're all sisters. They're all a family. And although there is a Jordan that splits right between them, they're still together. And he said to them, go back to your tents with much wealth. So verse 8, what we get is that whole treasure. So they didn't expect this part. They didn't expect to get spoils. They didn't expect to get the iron. They didn't expect to get clothing. And it kind of almost, you look back at Achan's story, the difference is Achan was coveting, and in the time that was going on, they were told not to do what he did. Well, the war time's over now. This is Joshua's leadership. Joshua's before the priest Eleazar. They're at a temple they made at Shiloh, and the people of the heads of the family and all the lords and ladies are right in front of him. He's saying this stuff because he's in charge. He's the leader. He's in command. So he's given these things to these people because they could have stayed and not fight. This is also verses 6 through 9. It's that summarization of what was going on. 
What did they get? Where did they go? These three brothers. So the people of Reuben, and this is a summary. So the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to their land in Gilead, that map I showed earlier. Their own land, which they possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses, not through Joshua. There had been a whole thing of things going on before Joshua entered the picture. Before they crossed into the Jordan the second time, God had created a plan through Moses, and it was still going. It's still going. So this is the end of that book. This is the end of that story. Today, um, I was actually in traffic, and um, there was a bumper sticker. A uh, person in front of me had a bumper sticker. And you know when you're stuck in traffic, you just start to look at everything. Well, it said in front of me, the bumper sticker said, Earth can't wait. Now, I don't know what that's associated with, but my mind started drifting, and right away I'm like, Earth can't wait. I'm like, Earth is going to have to wait. Because I'll see about myself, right? All the good things that God can do for me, all the things that I pray for, or how impatiently I can become. God, when are you going to step in? God, when are you going to help? God, there's people suffering. God, what are you going to do? God, I prayed for my neighbor. I prayed for my loved ones. I prayed for the people I don't even know. I prayed for a church plant. I prayed, prayed, prayed. And I forget at the end, I say amen. May, may it be your will. It's God's will, not mine will. It's his timing, not my timing. And all our lives are short. God's life, infinite. These people, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, they waited and waited. They, many of them were kids when they were hearing the stories, when they heard the stories about getting the promised land. What did that mean? And as I grew up, they were fed this, this promise, this inheritance, this good stuff from God to come. They finally had it, and they couldn't touch it. They chose not to. And it's not like they chose to wait. They chose to, in accordance with God's way, to keep living in God's will by being obedient to the calling, the inheritance, the promises, the oath they gave to Moses that they would fight. So they didn't sit around waiting They just said, hey, you know what? I can't go home, but I got better things to do. God's not coming yet. It's okay, because he told me there's better things I can do than just stay around waiting for him. God's not going to save my physical body. That's okay. Because my soul is saved. God's not going to save the earth. Well, that's okay, because in Revelation, he... He says they make a new one. God's not going to step in and do the things that he's supposed to do? Well, yeah, all, all things in good time, on his time. Oh, God, why don't you just do what I tell you to do? Sometimes in our relationship with God, we have a price price to follow him, and a price of what God can you do for me that will enable me to keep following you. See, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, they understood. They already had it. They already had it. They had the treasured land that was promised. They didn't have to go and fight, but they did anyways. 
Because at some point in your Christian walk, you will understand it too if you have yet to understand it. It's not about the physical. It's not about the rewards that God may or may not give you in this life. It's not about all those hours you've prayed so diligently to wake up one day and realize God hasn't answered a single prayer. It's about that faith. It's about that realization that God is real, that all of this is sinful. My skin, my flesh, my thoughts, my organs, sinful. If I wanted to put a post on social media and say, you know what? Why can't I just follow my heart and do all the things I love to do? It's good. If it's good, then it's love. If it's love, then it's righteous. Everything in my body, like yours, is sin. So we pay tribute to that. But not Gad and Reuben, not Manasseh, not the brothers here. In their act of service, obedience, and faith clinging to God, they were paying tribute to God's way and his people. God comes first. This is God's design. This is God's inheritance. This is God's way. Whether or not I have the blessings, whether or not I have the blessings of a great job, a good home, a working car, or farmland that produces crops relentlessly. That's all background stuff to God, to us and our walk with Christ. So how do we walk in all his ways? Verse five tells us to keep, to cling, to serve, to keep to his commandments, obey his ways, to cling to, to cling to him means to keep the faith, to serve him. In John 21, I believe uh, there's a conversation that goes on between Jesus and Peter. We talk about forgiveness, repentance, and God's way. Jesus tells Peter to tend my sheep. What were Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh doing? They were serving their brothers. Who were their brothers? God's children. Finally, do all this with all your heart, with all your soul. There's something I want to read for you guys here out of Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, right on the cross. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that might we receive the promised spirit through faith. New Testament talks a lot about Abraham, the promises of God, inheritance. Some of us, when we read New Testament, we don't always get to think about the story of Joshua or that this. This looks familiar. Luke 10, verse 27, and Jesus answered to them, you shall love the Lord your God with what? What did Joshua say? all your heart, with all your soul. Then Jesus says, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. These are the greatest commandments to follow. Walk in his ways means to follow God. Follow God's commandments. Be in his faith. Cling to him. Walk in in him. It's interesting that the things that we read about in Joshua, we think, how could God allow these things to happen? 
I thought we weren't supposed to war. I thought we weren't supposed to act violently. I thought we weren't supposed to do the things that Joshua's conquests did. But yet throughout the entirety of Joshua, we get so many parallels to Jesus Christ. We even read it in Revelation when Jesus is coming. The sword he brings is going to separate. He's going to separate us. This sheep to this sheep. All we have to do is love God. All we have to do is have faith in God. All we have to do is repent of our our sinful ways. Sometimes that doesn't seem enough. Especially to us. When the comforts of life become the distraction tickling our ear towards sin, but not telling us it's sin, by not telling us it's distraction, by telling a good Christian to go in the Bible and see how you can evade sin and call it grace. God gives grace. I could do whatever I want. But so often we forget even when Paul talks about the law etched on his heart, to keep following the commandments, the law that the Lord has given us. He didn't say Moses was gone, the law was gone. He said, no, something took its place, something greater, something better. And that thing is God incarnate, who then tells us here that we shall love the Lord our God as the greatest commandment, and likewise, your neighbor as well. There's a lot of love to the neighbor in Joshua's story. Gad and Reuben and Manasseh did just that. They showed and demonstrated by their action they loved God by following him, serving his people, walking in him, And secondly, by doing just that, they're loving on their neighbor. The idea of a refuge city was that even even Gentiles can enter the kingdom and seek and find refuge. That even someone like Rahab, a sinner who doesn't know God, can come to know him and be part of his family. How does this play out in our time today? It's still playing out in our time today. God is still telling us to love him. God is still telling us, don't forget my word. Don't forget me. Keep reading the word. Keep praying. Keep worshiping me. Because the comforts of life will distract you. And when it's too late, you'll figure it out. It's always been sin. So for the Christian, this is a send-off, an instruction, just like Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, to keep the faith. And this is how. Jesus tells us to love him and love others. Right? Love God, love people. A big part of loving people is sharing that love with people. That love is Jesus Christ. That light is Jesus Christ. That righteousness is Jesus Christ. And if you're hiding it, if you're hiding your, your, your light, Scripture will tell you many things, but you're just not being a follower. You, 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 you understand it, but just a little bit. You get to the part of loving your neighbor, you're like, yeah, not today. And Jesus says, oh, not today. <laughs> so as Christians, especially in our day today, 
We gotta be very careful, as the text in our passage says. Be very careful to follow God's way and not the comfort of the world. Be very careful to follow God's way and not society. Be very careful not to be too much like the Gentile or else you'll end up like the Gentile. Be very careful to be a follower of Christ. And, and what, not a fan? So in this message today, the biggest thing that I've, I've seen and witnessed is that a lot of this is coming from Joshua. When we look at the character of Joshua, we know he's zealous for the Lord. We know he'll do anything to serve the Lord, even kill Achan. Jesus doesn't... Jesus puts us in a position where we don't have to sacrifice nothing because he already sacrificed for us. The position he puts you into is one of love, to love others, to love him, and through that you will find true love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for bringing us all here together, Lord. Thank you for your message. Lord, I pray for everyone here who, do, who, do, who doesn't know you, Lord, that they will come to know you by just simply the Christian next door. That a believer, someone who's walking in your way, a child of God, will reach out to proclaim and testify who you are so that those who do not know you will come to know you so that we can win lost souls to you, Lord. Lord, we pray, I pray, Lord, that we, we have a spirit of serving, that we serve others, Lord. I, I pray we have a spirit of just loving on each other, on loving on people that we don't even know just by simply hearing them out and praying for them. And, and meeting them in their hour of need. Lord, I pray for the day we're in, Lord. I pray for that we can put on that armor and we understand the society that we live in is not one of righteousness. Far from that, Lord. I pray that we can look back at Joshua, Lord, as instruction and guidance of how to be Christian in a land that is much like Canaan. This world is not perfect. This world is sinful. We're sinners, Lord. Your word tells us that there's gonna come a day where you'll come. We wait earnestly for that day, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.